I feel a little bit nervous. There's some uh, themes been kind of rumbling around my being for a few months now in a very non-conceptual way. And um, I've kind of struggled a bit to form, make a form out of, <laughs> out of those musings. Um, but hopefully I, I've kind of managed to string some um, uh, mala beads together. That's how one of my friends was um, saying I could think about it. It's just a string of mala beads that will knock onto one another. Uh, I want to start actually by rejoicing in Tara Loka. Uh, because and and this and this um, form of the retreat, um, the the young Buddhist retreat, the young women's plus retreat that we're doing at the moment, um, it was about this time. I think it was five. Oh no, six years ago now. Six years um, that I came on this retreat, and it was one of the first retreats. I think it was definitely it was definitely the first time I've been to Tara Loka, and. Um, it was a, not a dissimilar theme, actually. It was on pieces of fire. And the team was Karen Adi and Sajayani and Singer Mati. So I just kind of wanted to rejoice in the lineage of um, uh, our, like the, the women's wing of the movement that have been bringing these retreats to young people and uh, extending back because it was a very significant retreat for me. And afterwards, I asked for ordination. So it really kind of holds a, a place uh, dear in my heart. And I think it's really great that we can still uh, come together and Tara Loka are holding this space for us. So I, I dedicate this talk to all those that have gone before me in holding this space. And uh, so in, in a few moments, uh, we'll do a, a, a little bit of meditation where you don't necessarily need to sit in meditation posture, actually, you can just sit comfortably. But um, this this kind of realm we're entering into, uh, I mean, it's explicit in the title, really, that we're kind of entering the realm of symbol and myth. And so finding, talking about it conceptually, it almost kind of immediately misses the point. <laughs> Um, but that's that's how we communicate. So um, we can we can circle around these themes, and um, the the kind of dharmic inspiration, if you send, if you like, coming from this talk is is um, a talk by Sangharachita called the Cremation Ground and the Celestial Maidens, which is from from a series of talks uh, from creative sim symbols of tantric Buddhism. So I was looking at the introduction to this uh, lecture series, which is in, in a book. Uh, they're all brought together in a book just this morning and thinking about um, symbol. And um, uh, yes, yeah, Sangarach to say is, a symbol is an object seen or felt or experienced as possessing a heightened significance that cannot be reduced to words or concepts. I'll just say that again. A symbol is an object seen or felt or experienced as possessing a heightened significance that cannot be reduced to words or concepts. So I think within that there's a there's a invitation um, to just stay, I guess, connected to your experience and your resonances as we kind of enter uh, into the symbolism of the cremation ground and the skull cup of wisdom um, and like we're all we're all different we're all our own set of conditionings we're all I mean we're in different countries so there'll be all sorts of different associations that we bring to these things as well as the symbolism that's archetypal and kind of um, collective in in a sense and I want I just wanted to bring that in because I really loved um, Garavavati's dedication yesterday evening and um, I really like that as a way of entering retreat space actually like evoking these uh, uh, well walls was is, is one way we can talk about them as the, the lotuses and the badras and the flames 
And so there, there, that, there, we, there we go straight, we've got three very strong symbols. So what, what we're going to do just now is I'll lead us into a bit of practice just to help us arrive into the space and arrive back into that, that sacred spot within the mandala. So if you want to just sit uh, comfortably or sit in your meditation posture and we'll do a little bit of practice before we hear some more of the talk. So I know for some of us, um, this symbolism, the realm of the cremation ground is new territory, territory to be exploring. So we can just tread gently. We had that lovely poem from Varadi this morning about staying close. We can just take one step, one step at a time. Let's just root down into our bodies. Just tuning into the breath as an anchor to our experience. Just allowing the out breath to help us drop down onto the earth. These qualities of solidity, stability, they rise up to meet us. Just feeling that place of contact feet or the sit bones. Seeing if you can feel in to the boundary between you and the earth. We're not separate from it. Imagine our roots stretching down into it like a great tree. Which our trunk rises up. Every day we inhabit this liminal space between earth and sky. We can inhabit the depths below and the heights above. So our torso stretches up into the blue sky. The space all around us, whether it's filled with buildings and roads, trees, parks, all the different manifestations of the elements stretching through space.
we can bring to mind the lotus flower. First layer of our mandala. A ring of lotuses. Symbol of growth. And beyond that, the Vajra wall of determination. In the outer ring, we have the flames, the wisdom flames. The rings of protection. The rings of transformation. and hold this mandala within the heart space. You can always come back to it, draw on its qualities. And just connecting with the base of our posture the roots, the earth. We keep our chest open, our heart open to the sky. When you're ready, coming out of the meditation in your own way, we'll open our eyes and come back, come back together. Okay, so I'll pick my first mala bead and um, I'm going to share with you a bit about um, how I get kind of prepared for the talk non, non, in a non-conceptual way because I think it uh, 
yeah we're stepping into into the unknown and and we're going to step gently which is what what i did in my preparation really so when i said yes to giving this talk uh, I was reading a series of books by Michelle Paver, uh, The Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. They're, they're children's books, <laughs> but they're absolutely fantastic. And um, I do, I mean, and I've, I've always loved being outside. I've always loved um, kind of connecting with the elements and big wide open spaces. But what came out of reading these books, um, which I kind of set so about 6,000 years ago, was this real longing to be in, in the forest and to be uh, connected with the earth. And somehow this, this talk and that longing seemed um, to kind of go hand in hand. Uh, Vasantara says in, in his book, um, well, there's two books. He's got a book on the symbols of um, the female Buddhas and one on uh, the tantric deities. And he says, if you want to, um, meet the darkness you need to you need to mean it and uh, we do kind of don't we don't step into this kind of um half-heartedly uh because if we yeah we're looking to engage with all our energies um i guess that's that's one of the first things we're kind of doing here when we're looking at the cremation ground and padma sampava and the darkness it's that we're looking at all the different aspects of ourselves in our heights and our depths and for me, there's something really uh, important about stepping outside of the, the four walls, um, which I often use to define myself. So I started building a shelter in the woods and um, kind of gathering uh, wood and sticks together and uh, pulling lots of fern. And I built, I built myself this shelter and then I started building a stupa um, and gathering like, uh, yeah, it was different, like pebbles from, from the burn from the stream that runs through Dana Kosha. And I was like hiding like treasures within it and uh, then gathering different bit, bits of rock to kind of build this stupa. And then I went off to um, find some bones uh, and kind of gathered them into the space. And I took one of my vultures feathers from Akashavana and um, yeah, and so I've been med I've been meditating outside uh, in this space. And at, at one point, there was a point during this process where uh, I met fear and was like, oh, I'm not actually sure about this. and got a <laughs> got a bit um, freaked out, really, and came, came back to the community to talk, talk to some people because some um, yeah, I guess there's strong, it's strong forces. So I was trying to create a, um, a space where I was stepping outside of my kind of comfort zone. And yeah, these walls that I feel like uh, can can define me. And actually, I really, Akash Jyoti was saying, I went camping recently. And one of the things I really noticed on that trip um, was how I created my sense of self in the morning. So there's this kind of uh, practice that Sangharachita suggests that we can do um, in his book, Know Your Mind, which is to watch what our thought pattern is first thing in the morning. And um, uh, so I started paying attention to this and it was really quite sobering um, the way that I judge myself pretty much every day when I wake up on kind of how I feel like, so what I've eaten the day before might affect like how I feel about myself the next day. Um, like kind of like, or oh, how's my body today? Do I feel like I'm like attractive enough? Like, and this, it's all quite subtle. Um, and then like, or what, and then kind of what have I got to achieve? Like, what have I got to do? Uh, oh, my room's a mess. These kind of like, uh, just very like mundane things that, uh, I kind of the, oh, sometimes the first things that come come into my mind in the morning. I was quite um, shocked by that because I, I feel like on the whole, I've got quite a good um, like po like a positive outlook on life and uh, a relative amount of self-confidence. But there was still this kind of subtle undermining of my being. And when I was out in my tent, it just didn't 
that, like that just <laughs> my mind just didn't go there it was more i just kind of wake up and see whether i felt cold or not uh <laughs> and um you know think about what the what was the first priority was it like having a, a hot drink or going to the toilet or i don't know it just it kind of brought brought everything back down to earth and um it was just a much freer way of being and that um that freedom i guess is kind of what we're looking for as we might enter into the cremation ground so i guess one point of tell telling these stories is um, external conditions do really make a difference to uh, what's happening for us internally. So this creation of the mandala, our kind of inner mandala, can help us create a, a space in which, in which we can um, explore our being in a different way. And we can do that externally as well. So I started with the external, like I built a, I built a shelter. <laughs> in the woods um that, that was kind of like a, a space in which i could try and, and enter into a different realm internally okay so yeah wrong book i've got this little pile of books here of things to read from um just picked up the wrong one. Yeah, so the um, cremation ground. So uh, Bante Sangaracta says, uh, if the first association of the cremation ground is death and impermanence, following hard upon its heels comes the most immediate emotional um, association, fear. So I kind of already touched on this because that was what happened to me when I tried to, <laughs> when I kind of created this external um, space uh, for me to dwell in this realm was I experienced fear. And um, Pema Chodron says, fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. So if we're experiencing uh, fear, uh, that's a total, totally normal reaction. So we've got fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. So as I was thinking about that, I was like, well, what truth? And um, I guess it's there in what, in what Sangha actually says that uh, with the cremation ground, we're confronting in the most immediate sense, uh, death and impermanence. Uh, yeah, so that that is the the truth we're looking at. This it's an in, inescapable truth, um, and I guess the cremation ground takes that in its fullest sense of death. But we experience impermanence in many ways in our in our lives, and that is one of these um, what's called the three lakshanas or the three marks of conditioned existence. Is that all conditioned things are impermanent? So the cremation ground is a place of groundlessness. Um, yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a, we, we step into the groundlessness of the present moment and are confronted with the ungraspable nature of things. Uh, and fear can be quite a, na a, a natural response to a sense of groundlessness. So we're starting to get a bit more of a sense of what the uh, symbol of the cremation ground or one of its symbols might mean. And Sangharachita uh, in the talk, he talks about this as the crucial situation. So I'm just going to read um, a paragraph on that, on this cr uh, crucial si situation. So the cremation ground is a place you choose to enter. I'm going to come back to that point. <laughs> the cremation ground is a place you choose to enter. You don't wait for death to come to you, for the corpse to pass by in the street outside. You go looking for death. You go seeking out fear. You court them, invite them. Come on, do your worst, I'm ready. So the cremation ground represents a crucial situation, a situation of crisis into which you deliberately plunge yourself. 
and in which you are compelled to change, in which you must develop or die. In short, it is the place where you deliberately seek out whatever other people avoid, indeed, whatever you yourself want to avoid. The cremation ground is therefore a symbol of transformation, the transformation of your whole being from depths to the heights, the transformation of every aspect of your consciousness. So I'm going to kind of un unpick that a little bit because I'm, when I was uh, reading it, I guess one of my first reactions is to that first line, the cremation ground is a place you choose to enter. I was like, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> really? Do you really want to go there? Um, I don't, and um, yeah, so so that got me that got me thinking. Um, and two questions came into my mind. One of which is how how do we get into the cremation ground? Um, and the, then the other is what we do when we get there. And um, tomorrow in this, this 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 time tomorrow, we're going to hear two personal talks from Kusla Davy and Singharava. So we'll have um, we'll be getting their kind of take our personal take on what it is to enter the cremation ground. So yeah i'm gonna just explore this bit how do we get there because i don't think um we always want to go <laughs> um we don't i don't always think we kind of choose to enter it but somehow we end up there but it is definitely possible to de deliberately seek seek out the cremation ground and um uh yeah, that's the, so. There's three ways I'm, uh, that I thought that I, I've ended up in a cremation ground, and one of them I have deliberately sought it out. And that can be like as a smaller thing of um, like going to the woods in the dark, turning the light out, and seeing how long it takes for you to freak out and turn the light back on, <laughs> like just to like experience fear, like when your other senses are removed. Um, and another way I was thinking that kind of every, every day to step out of my comfort zone and I often uh, swim in the in the lock and the water's cold and every day I kind of have to overcome um, a, a sense of resistance. I think one major way we can end up in the cremation ground is through communication. Um, reality is relational. We are always relating to whatever uh, what, whatever, whether we're, we're on our own and we're relating to ourselves and the external environment, um, and often it's it's with people, and communication can be challenging. Uh, and so the fear in this regard for me is often it's a fear of um, rejection, a fear of getting it wrong. Um, yeah, so it's a situation where you're risk you're risking yourself, you're entering that groundless space, you're making yourself a bit vulnerable. Uh, I think giving talks, especially talks on the cremation grounds, good way to get into the cremation ground. Um, I was thinking about ask, asking out someone out on a date. <laughs> the real risk of um, rejection in that. Uh, so, and then there's bigger things, you know, like changing your job, changing where you live, changing relationships. So it's all these things that take us out of the familiar and into the unknown. Uh, and we can do that kind of we, yeah, we can seek out those situations because we know that they might help us grow. We can have a sense that, oh, this is keeping me a bit small right now. Um, or like we're particularly attached to something and it's time to let it go. So we'll step out outside ourselves. So that's kind of one way I think we can get there. Um, but <laughs> another way, this is a really painful one, is that we blindly walk into it uh, through our own delusions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm laughing, but it's really not funny. Like our minds are, are on fire with uh, greed, hatred and delusion. And um, we're not always aware of why we're doing what we're doing. And we make mistakes. We get things wrong. We hurt people and we hurt ourselves. And that kind of makes me want to cry saying it. Um, and I guess for me, this is kind of the worst um, cremation ground that we can end up in is the one that's of our own making. 
un unwillingly, unwillingly. Um, yeah. So we don't, I feel like that one, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't choose to enter it, but we just get, we get it wrong and we make mistakes. And another way that we can end up there is um, like life, life happens to us. Um, we might get ill, uh, our friends and family might get ill, we will all die, people we know die, um, our parents get sick, um, we may have lost parents, uh, even at a younger age, um, relationships break down, our partner leaves us, uh, we lose a job, we can lose our financial security, uh, a global pandemic happens. <laughs> so anything where like the rug, the rugs pulled out from under our feet can throw us into a cremation ground, which is not of our own making. And that that will happen to us. So it's, I guess they're situations of loss, it's situations where we meet in impermanence um, very fully and that demon kind of has a grip on us and stares us in the face. So I think um, another, another way I was thinking about this was um, uh, Sangaraj talks about the path of regular steps, a path of irregular and irregular steps, and I think if we if we commit ourselves to our practice and we commit ourselves to practicing ethics and develop our ethical um, sensitivity around all acts of body, speech and mind, we seem to end up stepping into cremation grounds as we challenge ourselves to transform our habits and maybe challenge others to transform our habits. So I think just by committing ourselves to our, our practice and to transforming ourselves and moving towards um, this ideal of enlightenment, we will end up in the cremation ground. So I'm going to look now at once we've kind of got there and there might be different different ways in that um, in the situations I've just described that you particularly uh, recognize or resonate with, or well, there might be different ways that you've ended up in a cremation ground. Um, so I think the question is, is however we've got there, what are we going to do when we're there? Because <laughs> um, I guess in that, in this, the quote that I read um, by Sangharachita, he says you, you kind of choose to enter it, which you may well have done. But once um, you're kind of in this situation of crisis, I mean, he's, he's very strong. He says you must um, develop or die. I mean, that, those are quite strong words. I mean, I'd think, think about it as like, are we able to turn towards our experience um, in this situation? Or what, like whatever the difficult situation is, can we kind of gently uh, with as much kindness as possible turn turn towards the difficulty we're facing and stay with it and in the process of staying with it that's where we enter into the process of transformation because it can be very tempting to turn um turn away and run <laughs> for some reason when i was thinking about this i got um, i'm quite a big tolkien fan but i was thinking about lord of the rings and frodo on his quest to destroy the the one ring that um you know, is kind of the root of all all evil and throw it into Mount Doom. And when he actually gets to Mount Doom, he succumbs and he puts the ring on. Um, and, it, and I guess it gets destroyed because he ent enters into this um, fight with, with Gollum who bites off his finger and um, the ring is kind of liberated and uh, Frodo, I guess, is liberated from its power. But I was just really thinking about that, you know, the 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 journey that we go on and that it is really possible to falter like Frodo faltered um, at the last minute and we can want to want to uh, crawl back under the duvet and not enter into <laughs> enter into or stay in relationship to, to stay in this um, relational aspect of our experience. So I'm just going to come back to fear at this point because I think this is uh, when once we're there, you know, we can really we can really face um, fear and 
the thing with transformation is we don't we don't know it's a kind of unknown we don't know what we're going to get transformed uh into so i've got this quote on fear i'm not actually sure who it's from but i'll try and i'll try and look it up so fear is not a sign that we are doing anything wrong the important thing is not to be afraid of fear we need to let it be a messenger a companion on the way in Buddhism, the way of the warrior is to engage fear directly, to feel its energy, receive its intelligence and take the next step to continue on the journey with fear. As long as we have an ego, fear is an important and intelligent part of life. It really is an expression of fearlessness because a person who is willing to feel fear and have it as their companion, messenger and teacher is a person who is basically fearless. If you're not afraid of fear, you're not afraid of anything. Yeah, so fear can be a companion, a messenger and a teacher. And then I thought about what this feels a bit like in reality. <laughs> And um, uh, Vasantara says in, in his, when he's writing about uh, the darkening and maybe, maybe Padmasambha as well, that this, this realm that we're in here is feeling the Dharma in your guts. And I was thinking about times where I've, I've been in um, uh, cremation ground and really kind of faced with a lot of loss and grief and pain. And I'm like literally down on my hands and knees wanting to be sick. Um, and, um, yeah, the heart, like the heartache of loss can be consuming. Yeah. And the, sometimes the, the, the pain that we experience can feel unbearable. Yeah. So it's really feeling feeling the dharma in our guts and having the courage to look that truth in the eye um yeah sangarach to says um that uh says one may say that the most Favourable conditions for breaking through are the unfavourable ones. Usually one does not break through when things are going well. Um, it says the Buddha sweated and struggled and starved himself for six years and it seemed to himself at least to be no nearer to his goal. And according to legend, he sat, sat under the Bodhi tree and clenched his teeth saying, flesh may wither, blood may dry up, but until I have gained enlightenment, I'm not getting up from this seat. So this was the crisis for him. So that was, I guess, a crucial situation um, for the Buddha. And um, he broke through. So there is hope <laughs> um, that when we're, f we're faced with difficulty, uh, transformation is possible. Like. It, it is possible we grow and we change and we learn and i think one of the things that i've really deeply learned um when i've been in kind of really difficult um, situations is that we're not in it in it alone in a sense um and we have this example in the buddha we kind of have to go forth alone there is a going forth to step in into difficult situations and meet them but we're like even though we, we will each have our own kind of unique difficulties, um, perceptions of the world. Uh, but that is, it's kind of our difficulties are universal in the way we all experience suffering and we all meet impermanence. Um, we all meet loss, we all meet death and we're all connected. So that interconnectedness, um, I don't know, gives me faith, it gives me confidence that we're each of us are capable of uh, meeting the demons when they come. And if we do that with awareness, we have choice. And if we do that with awareness, we have um, a freedom to move within 
uh, what can feel like a real difficulty to kind of like climb out of our hole because uh, the truth is liberating once we can see deeply into those um, truths particularly this truth of impermanence uh, we can start moving away from what we're uh, attached to and relate to it more with love So I think in terms of like what we do when we get there, uh, we kind of hit the um, basis of what it is to be a Buddhist. And I was so I was looking at this um, Bante's talk on the on the path of regular steps, because I really um, some part of me, I guess, just really believes it like in this path of regular steps and that if we just keep going in our practice, we will grow and transform, we'll meet different cremation grounds and we'll grow and transform. And what where he gets to in this lecture is that we always have to go back to the three jewels and he says he says we have as it were to go down on our knees and we have to go for refuge saying budhang saranangha chami dhammang saranangha chami sanghang saranangha chami so we say to the buddha for refuge i go to the dharma for refuge i go to the sangha for refuge i go so bante says this is where buddhism really begins this is we may say is the root. This is the foundation. This is the absolute bedrock of our spiritual life. This is how we really start practicing the path by going for refuge. So I don't know. And I've definitely felt that like, uh, when the ground is groundless, we can go for refuge to the three jewels. They are the bedrock, they will be there um, and they will support us. And in that we have the Sangha and we have each other that we can, that we can turn towards. So this, the cremation ground um, is a way of entering the mandala. So there are the, we, we, in our dedication ceremony and um, in the, in that, like starting our practice, we evoke these walls of um, lotuses and vajras and flames. And traditionally, um, in some mandalas beyond this, we have the eight great cremation grounds. And I guess one of the kind of symbols of them being there is that the cremation grounds are everywhere. And to step into the mandala, we have to go go through the cremation grounds. We have to go through the flames to kind of enter into the, um, yeah, the kind of the blue sky, I guess, the sky-like mind, which we can find in, in the center in our hearts. So I think there's something really important for us to reflect upon in, in all of this, which is um, what does our going for refuge mean for us? Like what, is our practice at the moment like what inspires us what moves us because we can't um like what's what will sustain you what, what will sustain you to st to stand your ground to kind of um stay close to stay close to your heart to stay close um to what's important to you Yeah, so I think that's that's one of the questions we can we can maybe pick up in our groups is kind of how I think it's always really important. Like if we're if um we think about the center of our mandala and we say, oh well, going for refuge in this is in the center of my mandala. Like, how do you translate that for yourself? What does that mean for you um, right now? And that that will be it. It will change. It will change from time to time. Like, how is that manifested in your life, or how would you like it to manifest? And one of the um, ways that we can kind of nourish this center is um, is calling upon um, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the figures that we've got particularly associated with the cremation ground, uh, um, Padmasambhava and the Darkanese. So at this point, I would re I really recommend that you listen to Bante's talk on the cremation ground and the celestial maidens. And there's also two um, really good talks by Moksha Tara, uh, who's a um, young Dharmacharani from Sheffield, and one's called The Burning Ground. And the, uh, I think that 
other one i can't quite remember the name anyway they're both on free british audio i'll put the links to them in the padlet because she um she particularly unpacks some of the symbolism a lot more that we we don't have time um to go into today but i am i'm gonna kind of enter into this realm a bit of padma sambhava and the and the darkness because uh, i think there's there's real inspiration to be uh drawn upon here and 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 also really important symbolism in in both these kind of two two figures so just to say uh, i'm going to touch a bit on padma sambhava and talk a bit a bit more about the darkness but there's um, symbolism that's inherent in both of them uh, so padma sambhava is a historical figure that's um, steeped in in myth and he was uh, born, well, his name means lotus born, and um, he was born in the middle of the Lake Dharnakosha on a red lotus flower from a beam of light from Amitabha's head. I mean, it's a great place. It's a great place to start. <laughs> and, um, uh, but he, he, he was brought up by, by a king in, in Northern India and he went forth, he went forth on a quest. Well, actually he was banished, but, um, we don't have time to go into the into the story of it and he went to practice in the cremation grounds and in the cremation grounds he met and tamed these darkenies so there are darkers as well which is a kind of uh, uh male figure but the darkenies are typically uh, yeah they're female um deities or or buddhist figures and um padma Samba, one of padma Samba's real strengths is that he can tame and subdue uh, demons and darkness, and we can take that as um, he can tame and subdue the forces within ourselves. So Padma Sambhava is really, a, he's a figure of transformation and he's a figure of like deep, fierce love and compassion with which, um, so we can kind of take that fierce love and compassion and, and meet ourselves and all the different parts of ourselves with that. And um, yeah, so he meets Darkenes in the cremation ground. And um, I'll just briefly describe um, a Darkeny. I mean, I've got one. I'm, I don't know whether this. Probably. So we've got, she's, a, she's kind of, um, Darkeny kind of can translate as sky dancer. And um, I mean, this is it's a gold figure, but she's she's red and she's naked and she wears garlands of skulls and she holds a, um, a skull cup and she holds a cat vanga. So I'm going to just talk about two of these. Um, these symbols that are associated with the darkening and associated with Padma Sambhava, because I think they're, they're really. Um, yeah, it's really important um, or we've got things to learn from them. So first, I'm going to talk about the cat vanga, which is this wee, um, uh, like staff that she holds and that Padma Samava holds. And I mean, a staff doesn't kind of cut it. So we'll use the word um, <laughs> cat vanga. Uh, and it, this is a, it's a symbol of integration, really. And they both it's a symbol of the hidden consort. So I really uh, love this part of the story in, in Yeshe Sogyal who's one of Padma Sambhava's um, consorts. So he, he kind of practices with the, several female practitioners during his life. And um, at one point he transforms uh, Yeshe Sogyal into the cat vanga. And um, because she can't be seen, like the kind of feminine forces can't be seen, but he takes them with them in the, in the form of his kind of magical trident. And so, so similarly, like Padma Sambhava has a cat vanga and the darkeny holds one. So it's the integration of all aspects of our being. And like, I guess talking about masculine and feminine forces is just one, one way of talking about all our different energies, all the different aspects of us. And um, so in, when we look at these figures and we might um, relate to them on gender, it's kind of, I see this kind of cat vanga and it's transcended because uh, it's kind of bringing all of that, all of those energies in into being and then both figures also hold the skull cup which is a human a human skull so i was really trying to like imagine this um 
like if my head was going to be transformed like in into a skull cup like i was like what angle would they kind of um i don't know remove my head because it's just something really like um yeah it's it's a real symbol of of um death and impermanence to hold a a, a human uh, skull cup and um Vasanta says in his book that the skull cup symbolizes the death of the ego uh the spiritual death which creates space the experience of the open dimension yeah so i guess at this at this point it's a symbol of really having gone gone beyond fear of um, everything that keeps us small. And like, let, so we're in the realm of, of letting go, of really letting go of what whatever keeps us small and st stepping into an expansive, an expansive way of being. And within the skull cup, we've got the Amrita nectar, which um, is, uh, looks like blood. So it's the it's our it's the life force and the darkness she holds it and she's she's drinking it and she offers it to us. So it's that real um, I don't know if you just think about your blood pumping around your body. It's that real life life force, um, our inspiration, what what keeps us in our practice, what gives us courage. Yeah. So we can draw on these figures um, when our like inner resources feel depleted and we're at rock bottom. Um, we can we can um, turn towards these figures. I mean, and I'd go as far as to say that I would pray to them and just call on them to draw us down um, and and give us courage. And um, I'm coming towards the end now, but I wanted to say something about these figures. They're wisdom figures and. Um, one of the there's three levels of wisdom and one of them is is listening it's the first it's the first level of, of wisdom is to listen so we can listen to the um wisdom of padmasambhava and of the darkness but i think we also really need to deeply listen to our bodies to deeply listen to what they're telling us about what we're holding on to where we're experiencing reactions like what is important to us, what inspires us. I think the wisdom of our body is invaluable. And um, by deeply listening to that, we can navigate our way through the cremation ground. I think we can also deeply listen to um, uh, our friends. They help us see our blind spots. And also I was thinking about our dreams. Uh, are also sometimes guides, a guide from beyond. Yeah, I could say more about that, but um, we're, I'm going to uh, draw to a close, a close soon. Um, yeah, but a real invitation to, to yeah, to deep, deeply listen. So I just want to touch before I finish on um, a final way into the cremation ground. And um, it's quite simple. And I think that is, it's just to open our eyes, <laughs> to open our eyes and look um, at the world. And it's, it's pretty much as, as simple as that. I was saying earlier, like um, our minds are on fire with greed, hatred and delusion, and the world is on fire with greed, hatred and delusion. And we're fortunate, fortunate beings, and especially like where I'm um, sat here in a place of incredible privilege. Uh, yet the world is still on fire. Um, our Buddha land is an impure one. And um, I mean, I mentioned yesterday, like the like what's unfolding with the coronavirus in in India and um, the effect on our community there as well as the uh, the population is it's a literal cremation ground seeing those those funeral pyres um, climate change uh, or the climate crisis it's a cremation ground um, uh, yeah facing up to um, our racial conditioning um, our gender conditioning 
uh, the pan yeah the, the pandemic all all these things we we if we open our eyes to what's actually happening in the world, we step into a cremation ground and we're still challenged with this question of what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do when you look deeply into the reality of um, the unfolding climate crisis? Um, yeah, so these, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's, I think it's just a challenge in time to be alive. <laughs> and um, yeah and i think this is i i can open my eyes to these situations and then i can close them again and i'll open them and i'll close them and i think it, for me it's particularly hard to stay with the difficulties we're facing just because of the huge complexities of how we respond but i think as as buddhists um in my practice like i can go for refuge and i can um, keep practicing opening my heart to let in more and more compassion and then use that to have the courage to step forward and use my voice um, while well, use my actions um, to try and uh, do what I can within my sphere of influence and I think in that we can call upon Padma Sambhava we can call upon the darkness and we can call upon each other and our friendships that we do not have to do that alone. We can stand alongside one another as we um, try and navigate uh, what it is, what it is to be human, what it is to be a young person uh, in 2021 and uh, be faced with what can sometimes look like quite a bleak future. We have, um, yeah, a lot of beauty and compassion to guide us through that. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there. What am I? Oh yeah, I'll just say, I'll finish with some words of Padma Sambhava, actually. Um, as Padma Sambhava says, I am never far from those with faith, or even far from those without it. Though they do not see me, my children will always be protected by my compassion. <laughs>